Welcome back to session eight of this course on spiritual gifts. Once again, we're joined by class members here in our classroom, as well as students throughout the world. And we're very glad that you're here with us. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, doing an expository study, verse by verse, of what it says regarding spiritual gifts. And in the last session, we talked about the Trinity. We talked about the role that each of the members of the Godhead have in doing spiritual gifts. We mentioned that all members of the Godhead participate together in whatever work they do. And we also saw an analogy to the church where you never minister alone. You always minister together in community as you administer your spiritual gifts. I'm getting old, and the older I get, the more I forget. And so I need some ways to keep my mind active. Now many of you are younger, those in the classroom, those of you watching, you don't have to worry about this yet, but someday you will. And what I do is I am doing crossword puzzles because it keeps my mind active. One other thing that I do are jigsaw puzzles. And both of those things require me to think and to try to manipulate things so that they make sense. That keeps the mind active. I have to admit, I like crossword puzzles far more than I like jigsaw puzzles. But maybe it's because I don't quite have the technique down. As I understand it, when you do a jigsaw puzzle, the best way to do it is to do the outside first, to do the square pieces, and then try to fill in the middle. Most of the time when I do jigsaw puzzles, I forget about the square pieces and I go, oh, those two go together, and then I'm starting in the middle and then I never finish. But there's a famous story about some preschoolers, some toddlers, who were in their playroom, and there happened to be a table in the room that had a glass top to it. Now, I don't know why any mother would have a table with a glass top in the room, but she did. And on there were, was a jigsaw puzzle, and it had many pieces. Most of the time when toddlers work on jigsaw puzzles, they have like 20 pieces to put together. This was one that had 200 pieces. And so the mom didn't realize it was in there. She had been working on it. And when she came back uh, later in the afternoon, the jigsaw puzzle was done. And these children are under the age of five. And how in the world did they put that jigsaw puzzle together? Well, they asked, the mother asked, how did you do this? And the oldest said, well, mom, if you look under the table, you see that it's a picture of Jesus, and we just put his face together. Well, jigsaw puzzles are a little bit like putting the pieces together of the Bible. And as we've been going through this, we have been studying isolated bits of facts and information and trying to fit them together to understand the Bible better. No more so than in the study of spiritual gifts. If you would open your Bible, please, to the passage we're studying in session 8, 1 Corinthians 12, we're going to continue on with verses 7 through 11. Verse 7, as I mentioned in a previous session, is the most important single verse on spiritual gifts. If you know no other verse, this is the one to know. Why? Because it answers four questions about spiritual gifts. It answers who has spiritual gifts, what are spiritual gifts, who gives spiritual gifts, why are spiritual gifts given. All of that in just one verse. I love it. I love verses like that where I can get a lot of information 
in a short period of time. So let's read verse 7 and then I'll begin to unpack it. I will take the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle apart for a second and then put them back together. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Ah, short, simple, easy, four questions answered. Jigsaw puzzle piece number one. Who has spiritual gifts? First three wor uh, four words. Now to each one. Who has spiritual gifts? Each one who knows Jesus Christ as their Savior. If you know Christ and you love Him and you walk with Him and He is your Savior, you have a spiritual gift. You'll have at least one. Most people have more than one. And some people have many more than one. Now, when I was a boy, my mom was a very good baker and she would make cakes. And I have a sweet tooth, as you can tell. And it hasn't changed. And so my mom would make it, and then there was a routine. She would call the boys in, I have two brothers, so the three of us, and she would say, all right, now you can each have a piece of cake, and you each have to cut the piece of cake that you will take. Well, you can bet that us, the brothers, were looking at, okay, you got a millimeter more than I got. Yours is just a little too, mine's a little too small. We made sure it was exact, equal pieces. Well, unfortunately, that's not God's economy. God, being God, doesn't have to go, I'm going to make the spiritual gifts exactly even so that everybody has two spiritual gifts. No, he decides how many you get. And we see this in the parable of the talents where the man goes away and he gives one of his servants ten talents and another one five and another one one. Well, I don't know about you, but if I was the guy who had one, I'd be saying, how come that guy's got 10? I only get one. We can trust that God gives us the gifts that we should have. And we shouldn't look to those who have more gifts as though they're more important than we are. Why do you think people have more gifts than others? I think the simple reason is every gift is given to you because you need that gift for your unique assignment, your calling, the special task that God has, is giving you is directly related to your spiritual gifts. So, one person may only need one spiritual gift for their task, and another mean they need five, and another probably doesn't need ten. That would be maybe a little too many for somebody to handle. So don't look at the number of gifts as being the importance of the person in the kingdom of God. Let's go on to the next puzzle piece. The first one, now to each one, answers the who question. Who has gifts? The next puzzle piece answers the question, what are spiritual gifts? The manifestation of the Spirit. I have told you before in another session that the spiritual gift is the Holy Spirit. He is the gift. What greater gift could we have than God giving us the Holy Spirit to live within us and to help us in the many ways that He does? And this word manifestation is a very big term. So let's kind of explain what does that mean? Well, again, in the Greek, using the tools that I have used on the internet, I've learned that uh, the term manifestation comes from the Greek word phanerosis. Phanerosis. 
And in Strong's, that is G5321. And this helps us explain that big word. Manifestation means all of the following. To be made known. To become visible. To be plainly recognized. Thoroughly visible for who one is and what one does. To show oneself and to appear. All of those help me understand this very big word, manifestation. Basically, it's when the Holy Spirit chooses to make himself visible. And he does that through you in working his spiritual gift that he's given you to impact others. So what is a spiritual gift? The manifestation, the appearing, the becoming visible of the Holy Spirit. And the gift is the Spirit and the various gifts we have are merely reflections of who the Holy Spirit is. We used before several examples to try to explain this. I talked before about the wind. We don't see the wind. Can't look at it. But we can feel it. And we can see the trees move. And we can see uh, waves on the water. So we know it's there. Well, that would be like the Holy Spirit. We don't see him, but we see the effects of what he's done. That's one analogy. A second one that I've used is the analogy of a diamond. The diamond is beautiful. The Holy Spirit is beautiful. And he's one piece. But like a diamond, there are different facets, they call them. Different kind of diamond shape parts. And when you hold it up to the light, you can see different shades of color. Some sparkle. Some are red, some are blues, some are yellows. It's those facets of the Holy Spirit that are the gifts. This facet, well, that facet is the gift of discernment. This one is the gift of tongues. This one is mercy. That one's encouragement. That one, fill in the blank. That was a second one that I've used. And now I want to use a third one. I live in Chicago. And it's very near to a large lake. We call them the Great Lakes. There are five of them. And one of them is near my home. I live only five miles from it. It's called Lake Michigan. And I love the water. There's something very soothing, very calming about going to the water. And sometimes I just love to watch it and I always feel better which is probably appropriate since my last name is Lake. There is a beach by the lake that I sometimes go to, and there's a raised hill called a bluff with some benches along it, and I love to go there. And I'm high up, and I can look out and see the whole horizon of the lake. You can't see the other side. That's how big this lake is. And sometimes, I noticed that the lake, it's almost like it's expressing emotion. Sometimes it's angry and the waves are coming and the seas are swelling and I think, my, it almost looks dangerous. And then there's other times that the lake is perfectly still. There's no waves at all, just calm. And as I look out, the water is very blue. And then other times I notice that the lake might be dark blue up close and it gets a little lighter and a little lighter and a little lighter until eventually way out in the distance it's gray. Well this example is also one to help us understand sp spiritual gifts. The lake, as beautiful as it is, is the Holy Spirit. And the different ways that it looks is an example of the different spiritual gifts. So now we have a definition for spiritual gifts and we know who gets spiritual gifts and if we go to the next puzzle piece, it reads this way, is given. That answers the question, 
Where do we get spiritual gifts from? It's given to us by God. So we know all Christians have a spiritual gift. The Spirit is the gift and the actual gifts themselves are the manifestation, the unveiling, the revealing, the appearing of the Holy Spirit in different forms. And then is given says, you have nothing to do with it. Just like you have nothing to do with salvation. It is a free gift given to you by grace through faith. So there's nothing we can take credit for in using our gifts and whatever the result is because it's a gift given to us in order for God to work through us and touch lives. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. The final piece is the piece right at the end of the sentence, for the common good. It answers the question, why were spiritual gifts given? They were given for the common good, to benefit the whole church, so that the church would be built up, both in how many people attend a church, that there would be more and more and more, but also built up in the sense that the people in the church would become more mature, more greater understanding of the Bible, and the church would be strong. You know, in my family, uh, my late wife did some really wonderful things in terms of giving me gifts for Father's Day. Father's Day is a day set aside to celebrate our dads. In some ways, it's not as important as Mother's Day because there's something about a mom that every child connects with. I don't take it personally. Every child actually lived within their mother. That's a pretty close relationship and that bond is there always. There is something about the relationship between mother and child that a father can never experience because we never had that close intimate relationship of the child living within us. We love them. We care about them. We want the best for them. It's no different than a mom. But the difference is in the attachment the child has. So Father's Day, at least in America, is a day that some people go to or celebrate and other people don't. In my home, we celebrated it. And my wife always picked a gift that benefited not only me, but the whole family. And at first I was kind of disappointed, you know? They give me a gift and it's a gift that everybody can use. It was a little bit like when I was a teenager and I used to give my parents a record from a group that I really liked. That way I could listen to the record. My family gave me things like a piano because I love to play the piano, but so do other people in my family. They gave me for Father's Day a barbecue grill so that I could cook things outside, but everybody enjoyed it. They gave me a patio set with a table and chairs around it where we could sit outside and enjoy God's creation. But everybody sat around the table. And they gave me an outdoor fireplace. And what I mean is a round kettle where you put wood in there and it burns and it's safe because it's just within the confines of that kettle. Well, everybody sat around the kettle even though it was given to me. Even though your gift was given to you, it's for the benefit of everyone. Much like my gifts were given to me, but everyone benefited from me, from the gifts. So let's go on to verses uh, 8 through 11. 
to one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. Now start to notice that there are certain gifts that are mentioned here. One is the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between the Spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And finally, and still another, the interpretation of tongues. Nine different gifts are mentioned here. The interesting thing is, among those nine gifts, eight of them are only mentioned here. I told you that there are four passages on spiritual gifts, the main ones. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4. All eight of these are only mentioned here. The only one mentioned elsewhere is prophecy. So one thing you learn is the lists are different, which is why nobody knows how many gifts there really are. Now I'm not going to go into an in-depth study of these gifts because that will come in future sessions. But I do want to talk a little bit about a couple of items. You notice first that a little phrase, to another, is given. What this tells us is we're all given different gifts. There's no one package that everybody gets, a generic set of gifts. You get a certain set of gifts, I get some, and they're different than what you get. The second thing is it constantly says, by means of the same Spirit. So it's emphasizing that whatever the gift mentioned is one of the facets of the Holy Spirit, which we call a spiritual gift. And then finally, sometimes things are mentioned singularly, sometimes they're mentioned in the plural form. Let me explain that. We're going to go through these again. There's the message of wisdom. We've just simply shortened that to wisdom. But it's important to understand, it's a message that we're giving to someone. Same thing with knowledge. There's a message that we're giving that involves knowledge. Then there's faith, by means of the same Spirit. And then we come to gifts of healing, with an S on the end, in the plural form. There's more than one kind of healing. It could be physical healing, where our body is healed. It could be emotional healing, where our heart is healed. It could be healing in the brain, intellectually. It could be healing between relationships that are broken. There are different kinds of healings represented here. And then it mentions prophecy, which it men mentions this elsewhere. And then once again, it uses distinguishing between spirits, plural. So there are different spirits that are involved in needing to be discerned between. You remember I talked about evil, spirit of uh, demons, the spirit of right and wrong different spirits that need to be discerned. We've changed distinguishing between spirits to discernment. Then, again in the plural, speaking in different kinds of tongues. Plural. There is no one set of tongues. Tongues can manifest themselves differently with different people. And we'll talk about the tongues later. And then finally, Whenever there's someone speaking in tongues, the Bible says, unless there's somebody interpreting the tongues, don't speak in tongues. And that's a warning we'll again go across later. Let's look at the very last verse. All of these, all of these gifts that have just been mentioned are the work of one and the same Spirit. All the gifts are different expressions of the Holy Spirit. So they're all of the same Spirit and He gives them to each one, mentioned again, 
Now look at this phrase, just as he determines. Here's the good and the bad news. The good news is you have at least one gift. Here's the bad news. You don't get to choose. You can't look at all 21 and say, okay, Lord, I'll take that one. And, you know, this one kind of looks good. Could you give that to me? How about this one? Otherwise, we'd be God. God knows which gifts you have. And he's not going to give you a gift that you go, why'd you give me that gift? Man, I really wanted that gift. He gives you the perfect gifts for you so that when you take on the unique assignment that you have, which is the gift, it'll be perfect for you. Well, as we come to the end of this session, often we wonder, what about the other passages? What do they have to say? As 1 Corinthians continues, it talks about the body of Christ, and it compares the human body to the body of Christ. There's another passage that does that, and we'll save that for a future session. But in the next session, we're going to jump to the passage in Romans 12, which is much shorter, and try to gain some insight into then. So I hope you'll join us.